So you're all uh, very welcome uh, to the second webinar, uh, Practicing Food Sovereignty in the Climate Emergency, Imagining a Regenerative Community and Cooperative-Led Approach to the Local Food Economy. Uh, this is organized by the Green European Foundation in partnership with Green Foundation Ireland and Cultivate, the Sustainable Ireland Cooperative. Is part of the Climate Emergency Programme and is made possible with the financial support of the European Parliament to the Green European Foundation. I'm Davy Phillip uh, and I'm a facilitator with Cultivate based at the We Create Workspace here in Clog Jordan Eco Village. And I'm very involved in the community supported agriculture movement here, uh, the Open Food Network, and um, I'm a, a new board member to Tal of Bio, who we're going to hear a bit more from today. So last year, as part of the Green European Foundation's Climate Emergency Economy Project, we facilitated an exploration of cooperative and community approaches uh, called SCALE, and SCALE meaning supply chains and local economies, uh, which was really an exploration over two webinars uh, uh, a publication, and then a final podcast. And all of those are available at the GF uh, website. Thanks. Before we jump in, just thanks again to the Green European, F European Foundation and my Irish partners, uh, Green Foundation Ireland, uh, who in partnership with us and Cultivate have been uh, driving this project and the SCALE project uh, last year. This does launch our pamphlet. It's a 20-page pamphlet uh, that we're printing and taking to Glasgow. And we have a session in the side events in COP in a few weeks. Uh, and it's available now um, uh, on both the GF and the Green Foundation Ireland's website. So to get us moving, I'm delighted to introduce Eva Sufan Jakromat. She's a board member of the Green European Foundation, a director of the Green Polish Foundation, who are co-founders of the KZZ, which is the Living Earth Coalition, a, a Polish platform of advocacy uh, for agroecology, food sovereignty, and more sustainable and just a cap. He was a member of the KZZ steering committee, have been particularly involved in the topics of uh, GMOs, pesticide use, um, um, and also uh, topics related to the farm to fork strategy in the European uh, Green Deal. Eva, you're very welcome. And I'd invite you to maybe just say a few words on GF and tell us a little about the Living Earth Coalition and its advocacy for food sovereignty and agroecology. Uh, thank you, Davy. Uh, good afternoon uh, to uh, everyone. My name is Eva Sufin Jakmar. And I am really very pleased to welcome you on behalf of the uh, board of directors of the Green European Foundation, uh, which is organizer of this event and of the transnational project Climate Emergency Economy uh, that this event is part of. I also represent, as uh, David said, uh, uh, the Polish Green Foundation, Strefa Zieleni, uh, which is what we call a disseminating partner in this project. Uh, the Green European Foundation, Jeff, is one of 10 uh, European level political foundations founded, uh, funded by the European Parliament. Uh, it is linked to, but uh, independent of uh, other European green actors such as uh, uh, the European Green Party and the Green IFA group in the European Parliament. Jeff collaborates also very closely with the Federation of Young European Greens. The mission of Jeff is uh, to contribute to forge uh, a stronger, more participative uh, democracy in Europe, stimulating public debate uh, from a progressive green pers perspective, looking for the uh, most uh, adequate long-term, fair, and uh, resilient answers to the challenges of today's world. Uh, for Europe, uh, exchanging experiences and good practices uh, from nation states, uh, from our regions, uh, cities, and local communities. Jeff aspires uh, to reach broader audience across uh, Europe by acting as a laboratory uh, for new ideas. 
through the Green European Journal, uh, which would like to be the number one of uh, uh, political ecology in Europe, but also through other publications uh, in different languages, and uh, the pamphlet, The Food Sovereignty, Climate Action and Local Resilience that we are launching today uh, is a great example of the Jeff's publishing activity. The foundation also uh, develops capacity building uh, and political education programs for its partners and for uh, young European activists uh, from the EU, EU and no EU countries and supports its um, uh, uh, national partners across Europe to organize conferences, seminars, webinars, uh, and other events and exchanges, uh, mainly through transnational projects. And the climate emergency uh, economy project uh, is exactly one of them. Uh, over the last uh, the past few years, Jeff has been exploring with several partners the challenge of a climate emergency economy focus on hard to decarbonize sectors like uh, transport, trade, industry, or agriculture. Uh, looking for uh, answering the uh, for answers to the question, what would an economy that faced up to the reality of the climate emergency look like? And this year, this, uh, there is a continuity of this project with three pillars, uh, hydrogen um, uh, uh, use to decarbonize industry and transport, uh, the second one, food sovereignty and regional resilience, and the last one, transport infrastructure investment and trade. And today event, we are in the second pillar, and our foundation, Strefa Zeleni, is a disseminated partner for this second pillar as we are uh, strongly involved in this topic. So uh, the uh, pamphlet that is launched today, uh, Strefa Zeleni and the uh, uh, Koalicja Żywa Ziemia, it's the Polish name of this Living Earth Coalition, with, uh, will definitely use uh, uh, we are in Poland, one of founder uh, organization of this coalition. It's a platform of more than 20 organizations uh, with, uh, among others, the big NGOs like uh, WWF and Greenpeace, but and the and Nieleni Network for, uh, for food sovereignty. Uh, the coalition was funded in 2018 to just to influence the uh, process and political decisions uh, around the new common agricultural policy uh, as, a f f as a part of farm to fork um, uh, strategy of the European Green Deal. We stimulate public debate and promote the change of model of agriculture, uh, of the rules of the European Union agricultural and food policy, agroecology, uh, food sovereignty, local food production and distribution, peasant and organic farming, uh, short supply chains, uh, agrotechnics regenerative for soils and biodiversity, fair trade agreements, uh, affordable local and good quality food, uh, fixing carbon and water cycles, etc. Those measures and directions we defend. Uh, I will finish presenting with a very concrete example why all those criteria and the solutions must be applied jointly. It's a, a story of a, uh, uh, that uh, happens four kilometers from the place that I live uh, most of, uh, uh, of the year. Uh, in my family house, 70 kilometers from the capital. It's a, a huge investment of a very, very huge uh, greenhouse cover, covering 22 hectares of land, partly replacing all the much smaller municipal greenhouse, partly uh, replacing uh, the municipal forest. Uh, it's one of several investment of this kind in Poland of the same Dutch millionaire we know that others uh, should uh, follow. The procedure for environmental uh, decisions started when the main construction of the greenhouse was already finished. And uh, we don't know yet how much water it will need and what will be its impact on water system in the region. We know from other places that there will be a very strong light pollution 
uh, and uh, it will contribute to the, but it will contribute to the local economy. There will be 2,000, uh, 250 local jobs, and the heating uh, comes from the nearby coal power plant. Uh, 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 the heating is their byproduct, so we are using the byproduct of this power plant. But we know also that the jobs will be poorly paid and not protected. And uh, the uh, conditions of work will be hard, especially in summer. You can imagine working in a, a greenhouse in summer. The production will be mostly conventional. The producer analysis, uh, the pesticides will be used in a sustainable and responsible manner. And part of the production could be or could be organic if the owner gets good subsidies, subsidies from the new uh, CAP eco, eco schemes. The regional shops and supermarkets will offer cheap tomatoes from this new Giga supplier, uh, what will force the numerous small local producers to give up tomato cultivation. Was there any public discussion and consultation before the investment passed, before the investment starts? No. Uh, it is what we understand by food sovereignty. I am sure that you will know the answer at the end of this webinar. Have a very good debate. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Eva. And that gets us off to a great start. If you're just arriving, you're very welcome uh, to this GEF webinar uh, with GFI, the Green Foundation of Ireland and Cultivate. Um, Please add any reflections, questions, insights, and most importantly, signposts to the initiatives you're working on in the chat. If you haven't done so, you're welcome to introduce yourself in the chat to build a sense of community in this sort of limited uh, webinar um, format. So let's dive in. Our, our main contribution to get us going, our next contribution is from Judith Hitchman. Judith is an Irish woman based in France. Uh, she's a food sovereignty activist and the current president of Urgency, a network of citizens, small-scale food producers, consumers, activists, and researchers representing local solidarity-based partnerships for agroecology um, networks and initiatives in over 40 countries. She also represents Urgency as a board member and joint coordinator of the Intercontinental Social and Solidarity Economy Network, REPRES. So Judith, you are very welcome. Um, and we've just uh, got a question for you. We'd like to ask you, how may a locally based economic model of agriculture and food distribution help us respond to the climate emergency? And why is the solidarity economy important? Judith, over to you and thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Davy, and hello everybody. And thank you all for inviting me to participate today. So the question of the climate crisis and food sovereignty are very closely interlinked. Um, you can see on this first slide, a photo taken during Hurricane Ophelia that hit Ireland four years ago. And this picture is taken in Tremor. And you can see the kind of impact that it is having on everything there. We have the climate crisis and change, and we also have COVID-19 at the moment. So the key question for all of us is how to build resilience. Now, community-supported agriculture contributes to the realization of solidarity economy in many different ways. First of all, because it is localized and we are relocalizing our food systems through it, but not only that, it means that we are working with agroecology, relearning the skills that our grandparents had of preserving food. And this tomato preserve was made in Romania when a hailstorm made the tomatoes unfit for the food boxes that were going to the CSA. But the Tomato sauce was going to be going out during the winter to supplement people's boxes. So agroecology and community supported agriculture today 
to a large extent equate to what we understand as sustainable food systems, because we have two key pillars, the first being food sovereignty and the second being solidarity economy. There are many benefits to local communities. First of all, the fact that it is really local, so there are very few food miles. There's either no or very little packaging, and we are working with ecological or agroecological farming. We have safe, healthy, nutritious food from a trusted source. We build agroecological community systems, and the word community is very key because unless we rebuild our local economy and decommodify food from the present situation where food is part of the World Trade Organization, we will never get there in terms of the climate crisis or food sovereignty. So we need to, and we work on re-educating the community on food and breaking very strongly with the industrial agriculture and agribusiness paradigm also to protect our local resources from land grabbing. And it helps us to localize the sustainable development goals. Um, Eva mentioned Nyelani Europe. Now in the Nyelani Forum on Agroecology in March, 2015, there was a very strong part of the declaration on local markets and developing alternative options to finance and other mechanisms for both producers and consumers and reshaping our markets through the relationship of solidarity between producers and consumers. And this involves also developing our links with the ongoing solidarity economy. Now, just a very quick word, solidarity economy is essentially a holistic human rights-based approach to the economy and the commons. It touches on all elements and some are particularly relevant to the climate crisis like community energy management and community land and water management as well as seeds and production and consumption. So I invite you to look into that further after this webinar. In FAO, we managed to get the 10 elements of agroecology accepted. And that includes, sorry, that includes a reference to solidarity economy as being one of the key levers for transitioning to sustainable food systems. In terms of the climate crisis, we need to compare the industrial agricultural paradigm to peasant agriculture. It's really a case of monoculture versus polyculture. The question of externalities and in industrial agriculture, it means virtually slave labor in terms of the way the food is produced. Whereas in agroecological methods, we have healthy soils, natural inputs, and practice as a social movement, which is very key. Sustainable local food systems and community supported agriculture needs to be extended as well to other solidarity based distributions, such as cooperative shops and also now there is the open food network that is another way of working towards social change and a low carbon footprint. Another very important aspect is green public procurement and working with local authorities. Another source of greenhouse gas emissions over and above the industrial agriculture per se is the huge amount of food loss and waste in the industrial food chain. Now, if you look at this little diagram, you can see that in a CSA, the total food loss and waste in the whole chain is approximately 6.7%, which includes unusable parts. Whereas in a supermarket and industrial chain, it is 55.2%. So that is another very strong argument in favor of the kind of work we're doing. In terms of nutrition, it's very important to consider that pesticides and other chemical inputs are harmful to people's health and children in particular. And there's a very poor nutritional value 
in germs of fats and sugar in the over-processed foods that are available in supermarkets. A step in the right direction is industrial organic, but that of course still leaves us with a very weak soil microbiome and lower nutritional value. So it can also, and very often is shipped over a very long distance, which means there's a lot of nutritional loss and value in terms of the food. Whereas locally grown, agroecologically sourced food is both much richer in terms of nutrients and soil microbiome, contributing to a healthier human microbiome, but also in terms of optimal nutrition and taste. So the key question really is whose economy is it that we want to support to fight the climate crisis? We're living in a period of excessively strong neoliberalism, which is opposed to the grassroots ownership of the system or outcomes. We see that on a daily basis in our negotiations, both at EU level and in the Rome-based agencies of the United Nations. The stakeholder model that is being promoted by the institutions is perhaps more participatory. It is really just we. So, the solidarity economy and food sovereignty represent systemic change and they are based on agro. Judith, you're having problems with your sound. You're as if you're hitting your microphone. Yep, sorry. Food, so is that better? Food sovereignty and agroecology must include the economic paradigm change, otherwise we will not get there. So the key questions are where and how is the food produced and can consumers buy their food, access their food in an affordable way outside the industrial food system? What are the impacts of an increasingly urbanized society? What are the options? What systems of governance are there for the alternatives? And how does this connect with the nutritional dimension? So how can we move forward from cheap industrial food and poverty for farmers and other food producers, including fishers, to decent livelihoods and affordable, healthy, nutritious food? Now, each CSA is self-governed with shared risks and benefits. There's a commitment to agroecology and local communities, as I already said, the carbon footprint is very light. Nutritious food is also seasonal. There's a possibility to work with local authorities and to include sliding scale payments to make it more affordable. And CSA networks are national and international with a strong coherent advocacy that we work on together with other social movements. And we now have increased global recognition. So this is just a little chart to show you the different kinds of benefits. I will make this available to other people if they want to have a look at it in more detail. What we're really looking at is a biodiverse bouquet of community-centered community flavors in terms of the response to the crisis. Part of the challenge that we're facing is that all the different aspects, land, workers' rights, seeds, water, peasants' rights, fisher, fishers' rights, consumers' rights, indigenous peoples' rights, and climate depend on different instruments and different institutions. So what I feel today as being a critical aspect is that we need to work more strongly together to join up and try and get these institutions working together to address the question. We need to do this collectively as social movements. So overcoming the challenges means placing a lot of importance on the building framework legislation that links food sovereignty, solidarity economy, nutrition and agroecology. And this framework legislation is very difficult to push through because of the corporate instances blocking us on a daily basis at all levels. Social movements support policies that focus on change, on participatory governance, and truly sustainable food systems. 
and consumers represent a constituency that is part of social movements because we do feel that it is wrong to place the responsibility on the individual. So on behalf of Urgency and all of our team, I would like to say thank you very much. And this picture represents a bitter cucumber. The cucumber is bitter and the seeds are very sweet. Thank you, Judith, that is excellent. So that's got us off to a good start. Um, we're gonna have two other short interventions now and then open up for some questions. So if you've got any insights or questions from Judith, we can bring them in in, uh, in about 20 minutes. So we're gonna do a little section we're calling Voices from the Field. And as I look through the chat, it's a rich field that we're operating in and many of you could have contributed to these sections. We're going to hear from Bridget Murphy uh, and, and <laughs> Lisa Fingleton. Um, and then we're going to take some questions, reflections, and we're going to hear a keynote from Thomas Waits, the MEP and ecological farmer from Austria. So let's start this voices from the, the field section. And um, I'll bring in Lisa. Uh, so Lisa, you're, you're very welcome. Uh, Lisa is an artist, a writer, and grower at the Barnaway, an eco-social organic farm and native woodland in, in Kerry. Her book, The Local Food Project, explores the power of growing and eating local food. Uh, every September, she organizes the 30-Day Local Food Challenge, which many of you seen, may have seen recently on social media. And she's currently the Kerry Visual Artist in Residence, exploring issues around climate, creativity, and food. You're very welcome, Lisa. So maybe in the short time we have, maybe you could tell us a little about what you've been doing and your different initiatives, bringing especially that artistic or creative uh, aspect to our local food economies and any lessons that might be useful to share. Perfect. Listen, it's lovely to be here and I'm just looking at all the chat and all the expertise in the room. So I'm guessing that a lot of us know the taste of real food. And uh, I think I'm realizing more and more, Davy, that a lot of people don't know what it tastes like. <laughs> you know, they're not used to eating it. So, so as Davy said, my name is Lisa Fingleton. I grew up on a farm in Stradbally, County Leash in the Midlands in Ireland. Um, and I suppose I was kind of gardening from when I was five, but I was eating local food from when I was born because my dad grew all our food and my dad is now in his 80s. And he's still growing food to feed all of us and all the extended family. Um, so the, the food must be doing somebody something good. Um, so I grew up always thinking that everybody ate like this. And we didn't eat in a restaurant, I think, until I was late teens. So I just I just always ate from home. And now I'm here in Kerry with my partner, Rena Blake. And we have an organic farm here just on the Wild Atlantic Way in Ballybunion. And we call it the Barn Away. We just had a, actually arrival of uh, 10 women arrived from Poland just as I was coming <laughs> to speak to you today. So that's really nice. So I'll, I'll talk to them later. And, and I suppose from going as a child, thinking that everybody, everybody was eating like this and everybody ate food, I've become more and more anxious about the fact that we are becoming more and more disconnected from our food. I never intended as an artist to make my work all about food. You know, I, it, it just seems to keep happening. So, um, so and, and I'm assuming that a lot of you here today are, are quite, um, quite anxious, even a little bit sometimes depressed about the state of the system. So I thought it might be useful just to talk about some of the things, the projects that I've been doing um, that hopefully might, might be a bit inspiring and, and a positive note. So as Davy mentioned, the Local Food Project is this book, um, the Local Food Project, and it's about sort of the journey that I came to in terms of thinking about local food. Um, a lot of it started with a sandwich, which is here in a drawing behind me. I, I Again, I rarely um, buy a food out, but um, I bought a BLT one day and uh, was quite hungry at the end of an evening and realized there were 43 ingredients in a bacon, lettuce and tomato sandwich. And uh, I was just like, what? What has happened? What has happened to our system, you know? Um, so there's, I drew it out then and then I ended up doing workshops with children and with adults about food. And I, I got people to design their own sandwiches. So I was asking children, well, if you could design the ethical sandwich, what would it look like? And as I was doing these workshops, I realized children didn't know where tomatoes came from. They didn't actually know that bacon came from a pig that had to be killed and all these kind of things. So it started to bring up so many different issues. And then I suppose from there, then I, I published the book, the, the, the Local Food Project. And 
I yeah, I, I suppose I thought no, I, I need I need to do more than that as well. Like the the the, the local food challenge happened at the same time. So every September, um, there's about 700 people on a, on a Facebook group, and you're welcome to join that, um, the local food project. Um, but every September, what we try and do is we try and eat from the island of Ireland for 30 days. Now, in the very beginning, I was doing 100%. Six years ago, we started this. So I was doing 100% food from the island of Ireland um, for 30 days. And the feedback over the years has been, it's, it's very expensive for a family to do that. So this year, some people just did literally a meal a day. But I have to say, even the meal a day um, gets such comments and such reaction. Um, Davy was asking me, what did I learn? The main feedback that I'm getting is people's frustration with labeling. And they're contacting me, but going, but how can I find the food? So a lot of you here today, I've seen a lot of networks that I would recognize. So we have access to farmers markets. We can do that. But there's a lot of people who are going into supermarkets to feed a family and picking up bottles. I, I have a drawing of this here and I don't want to pick on just one bottle, but this really sent me over the edge. Um, you know, so it's orange juice and it's got a Blasna here in award and the taste of Ireland. And it's, you know, expertly squeezed in Carlo. And I'm thinking, <laughs> Does nobody, does nobody think there's something wrong with this, you know, that, that, that the taste of Ireland is so disconnected from what's actually in the ingredients. And I would say that's one of the biggest things that, that, that people are feeding back, that frustration. And I suppose the fact that when I was a child, you know, we had the guaranteed label and we still have the guaranteed Irish label. But now if, if I import some food and I add value to it. I can then label it as, a, as an Irish food award or a, you know, a, a Blasna Heron award. And, and I think that that is causing um, real problems. I know um, Ava was saying about not putting the responsibility back on individuals, but I think we need to make it easy for people to support farmers and producers. And, and I don't feel that that's the case. Um, and, I, and I suppose one of the things that I've been concerned about is, you know, when we say local, I in no mean, no way mean that we are looking inward. I am doing this because of my concern about climate. Um, I was doing a, a talk at the Boris Festival recently and, and the president, Michael D. Higgins, was on, on before me. And he talked about the 82 million people who are displaced in the world since June and that that has doubled in the last decade and that 1% of our population, our global population, are displaced. So for me, I'm always thinking of this much bigger picture and how the poorest of the poor in the world are going to be most impacted by our actions. And when I, I used to work as a community worker and a lot of those big issues, you know, really um, just weighed me down too much. And I find that art helps me to, in some small way, express my devastation at times at where we're going uh, as a planet. So, you know, it's very much in that context of the bigger picture that I'm trying to do things here locally. And, um, you know, the other statistics that shock me, and I'm really bad at math, so I, I don't ask me questions about figures, but the figures that I think are really shocking um, was Eurostats 2016. I haven't had an update since that only 1% of our farms grow vegetables. 1% of our farms grow vegetables. We were the lowest in the Europe, and I keep asking for information to find out if that's still the case. I'm, it could even be worse. Um, and that also only 2% of our farms in Ireland are organic. And, you know, as the earlier speakers were saying, this is all so connected. You know, our rivers are being polluted at a ferocious rate because of all the, the effluent and all the chemicals that are going into the ground. So for me, uh, food is integral to everything. We can't sort out our water. We can't sort out our air unless we sort out our food, food systems. We can't sort out poverty in the world until we change our food systems. And the idea that 30% of our food is going into the bin, and yet we're still listening to this crap that they're saying, oh, we need to produce more, we need to produce more. No, we don't. We need to produce, we need to support rural communities, we need to support farmers, we need to support small growers, stop trying to wipe us out. And, um, and, and then we need to support consumers who are trying to make the right choices a lot of the time, but are simply not given the information. So I'm just very conscious that that's about seven minutes and um, yeah, but I've got a follow on question. I'm interested. Uh, that was great, Lisa. Thanks so much. I'm interested uh, as your role as, as an embedded artist and then the potential of the arts to help us engage uh, with what we're talking about today, our local food systems, restoring our ecosystems, making sure we have a strong local economy to make us more resilient. So is there any lessons from the creative arts or some of the, the processes you use that we could all learn from? 
Absolutely, and I'm so glad you asked me that. So I'm the, the first visual artist in residence. There's been, there's lots of other artists in residence, but I'm the first visual artist in residence with Kerry. And when I started, I asked the arts office, could I just focus on climate change, food and biodiversity? And she was very happy for me to do that. And I suppose it's quite timely that Creative Ireland launched a fund in the middle of the residency as well about how do we spark imagination? Because I think it can be so overwhelming that a lot of people I speak to just tell me they're turning off the television. They just can't bear to listen to the news. And it's not that as artists, it is our responsibility, but I think for those of us who have the energy and who have the passion, I think it's, it's a great opportunity that this now is being funded by the Arts Council and by Creative Ireland. So if just to very briefly, I had um, a 40 day residency. The first 20 days were about engaging the community. We had 1200 people at workshops in 20 days. And that was all about biodiversity. And it was all from here on our farm, people drawing in nature, sitting out, children doing um, biodiversity workshops. So I feel, and I absolutely believe that there is a, a huge appetite for people to engage on these issues, but to engage on these issues in a way that I suppose acknowledges their potential contribution and that we're not hammering down, you know, kind of, the, the 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 very depressing and heavy stuff all the time but are finding ways that people can creatively respond because I believe absolutely that when we're creative we're able to process things we're able to take in the information and we're able to put it out and for me I'm just in the middle of uh, writing a poem I, I spent the last few years writing poems in the pandemic and drawing and I just find for me personally that is the only way I can process it. And I was thrilled to have 1,200 people here in the forest here behind me. We planted um, 10,000 trees last June um, as part of our, I suppose, work around, um, you know, climate. <coughs> and uh, I was able to introduce people to the trees and, and it, was, it was amazing. And I think there's a huge appetite. I just wish my residency was longer. It finished. Yeah, and I think you're totally right. It's this crisis of imagination that we have that we can't actually imagine other ways to provide for ourselves or procure our needs or, you know, work with each other. And that's the challenge, isn't it? You know, that's critical, Davy, because yeah. if we don't, if we don't, ha I saw a quote the other day that said a map without utopia on it is not worth consulting. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have the vision of the type of world we want, if we, if I can't be saying to providers, why are our procurement rules not changing? Why are we not feeding every child and every adult who is sick in hospital with COVID or anything else? Why are we not feeding them local organic food and getting them better? Yeah. So that they, we need a vision. And I think as artists, we can do that. And as singers and as musicians. And change the narrative so that we understand that, uh, uh, you know, there's a rich sort of benefit for our own health, our own well being, our mental health by engaging with each other, by engaging with our uh, ecosystems, getting involved in a community supported agriculture project or a food hub or a food co op. So, Jude, um, thank you, Lisa, for, for joining us there. Uh, you're going to come back in a second with Judith and Bridget for uh, some questions. Uh, Bridget, are you there with us? Yeah. Okay. Hi, Bridget. Uh, Hi. So I uh, uh, am delighted that you're you're here with us. Um, Bridget is a regenerative hill farmer based in County Sligo, Ireland, and is a core member of Talav Bio, which is a new alliance of farmers, growers, and land workers on the island of Ireland and are like our, uh, our representatives in Via Campesina as well. Bridget's background is in land use, a tenure, a grain and reform in Southern Africa and, and in Ireland with a dedicated fo focus on women. And you may have seen in uh, Tel Aviv's social media last week, a big emphasis put on um, why is there, what, where are the women in agriculture? Why are they not reckon, recognized? So Tel Aviv are members of Via Campesina and just published a local food policy framework. Welcome, Bridget. And so maybe just to get us going, could you tell us a little about Tel Aviv and maybe something around some of the elements of your local food policy framework? Great, Davey, thank you very much. Um, and it was wonderful to hear uh, uh, Judith and, and Lisa's. And just to add in there for Lisa, you know, um, Ireland has 2% of, of, of land that's under organic production, but it's actually going backwards because the age profile of the people who got in involved back in the 1990s, they all getting to retirement age. So what we actually finding is instead of us moving forward to that, um, the goal of 7.5%, which is incredibly low anyway, we actually falling below the 2% and, and, and might even fall back below the 1%. So 
So on so many levels, this is actually quite frightening. I didn't actually grow up on a farm or have absolutely any connection with agriculture. Um, as you say, I grew up in South Africa and I qualified as a lawyer. Um, the bigger picture, the injustice was always something that motivated me. And, and I worked with, with rural communities, black communities who had lost land to apartheid and, and claiming it back. I came to visit my parents about 22 years ago and and here I am, um, a hill sheep farmer and, and an activist and, and still trying to make a difference, as you say, um, particularly as, a, as you mentioned, the, the woman's angle. It's just important to note that there are actually no routes for women to get to the tables, um, but that, that, that we can come to at some point in time. So Talif Bio, yeah, Talif Bio is a relatively new farming organization. We set up in about 2019. Like so many other organizations, we found that this two-year COVID hiatus has limited our ability to get onto the ground. And this approach is critical because our signature is that we operate from the ground up. We lead by example. We lead our regenerative and agroecological practices on the ground. Uh, we start with healthy living soil, and that's where our EIP comes in. We've recently been awarded a one-year European Innovation Partnership project uh, which we will be launching soon. It will be an online digital platform. Um, it's a peer-to-peer, farmer-led, farmer-designed soil biodiversity project. And we're going to be blogging it in real time over the growing season next year. The idea is going to be for farmers to learn what exists beneath their boots and how activities on your farm affect this biodiversity. So for example, what happens when you spread slurry out or what happens when you put compost out? We also lead our policy by practice from the ground up and that too is led by the farmers and by land workers. We've developed a, a, a focus to four campaigns to be taken forward over the next while. As I said, um, our boots on the ground is, is, is our jewel in the crown as we, as we mentioned. The Soil Biodiversity Project we're looking at a rights-based CAP strategic plan, which would include the dedicated focus on gender mainstreaming and then our local food policy, which today is all about. So Talif Bio is about delivering and living a landscape where people and ecosystems can, can exist and thrive together. We support the principles of food sovereignty, which provide a framework for the democratic reorganization of agricultural and food systems. We put the farmers, the land, the people, and the communities at the center of decision-making. So Talifio supports a critical transition to agroecological farming systems. We want to see the cap moving away from a focus on industry and agribusiness and growth and global markets towards a focus which secures future livelihoods for family farms uh, based on care and well-being. We want to see the resilience that Judith was speaking about built in, and we aim for thriving communities and ecosystems. Our CAP campaign is based, as I say, on the fact that the CAP is by far the most important policy framework that exists to achieve these goals. And the Irish strategic plan has the potential to transition Irish farming from a system based on mass production for export markets to one which truly regenerates our land ensures livelihoods and fairness for all farmers and meets the challenges of climate change. And this perspective is not at the social partner stakeholder forums and we need to get it there. Now, looking at our local food policy, it's based on the fact that Irish citizens want to live in this thriving environment, that they want to have access to high quality food. They want this high quality food to be produced by farmers who earn a fair wage while they regenerating those ecosystems and soils. And finally, this food should be affordable to all people, including the most vulnerable and marginalized communities in our societies. And it should be moving as directly as possible from farmers to consumers without the use of intermediaries. We believe the first step in supporting the sector is to offer the recognition to farmers who are producing primarily for the Irish market, coupled with a complete completely new set of complementary supports that don't exist at the moment. Our proposals, which as you say, Fergal has worked incredibly, um, there's a really, really wonderful policy framework sitting there. It, it's based on looking at income supports where 
as a local farmers are delivering into the market, the support matches their contribution um, to, to a maximum of 30,000. So say, for example, if the farmer is turning over 12,000, they would be matched with that with a further 12,000. So their income would be 24,000 for that year. So it's actually based on delivery as well. We look at finance, people and, and farmers producing in this way need access to credit and microcredit. There's the labor and the social aspects. Um, we recognize that this type of food production is highly labor intensive and Telefio supports a specific set of supports that include training and upskilling of new entrants into the sector. Access to land and young farmers um, is always a critical problem. The aging farming population um, and rural townlands wondering what their communities are going to look like into the future. I always kind of point out Talifio has, has a photograph um, of, of a campaign that they did of soil in the city in Dublin in 2019. And I love pointing it out to politicians and saying to them, look at the age demographic there. I mean, apart from one or two oldies that are kind of going gray, the bulk of the people that are sitting there are in their thirties. And it's, it's evenly male and female and their kids in those pictures. The regenerative and the agroecological perspective really does draw interest from this, this, this um, you know, the, the age demographic. And as I say, we just need to, 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 to get it to the table so that we can start doing that. So I suppose we need to recognize that multi-department integrated approach, but as I say, we need numbers. The establishment is not allowing us to participate without numbers. So we're going to be asking people to come along and kind of join us to start building that momentum, that social movement that people are talking about. Richard, could you link as in the chat to um, Tel Aviv's work and especially your new local food policy framework that you're sort of mentioning there? I'm going to bring I'm going to bring um, Judith and Lisa back in, and I just want to reflect on something. When I was talking to you yesterday, Bridget, you you mentioned this need for numbers. And I said, we just have to count differently. It's not how many members Talib Bio has. It's not how many CSAs we have. But once we take who's involved in this community-led or cooperative regenerative local food movement, we have a lot of numbers. And we just need to reflect that. So, uh, and this is a great example today, seeing the different initiatives that people are involved in of the participants. And we know there are thousands out there. So thanks, Bridget, for that. Thanks, Lisa and Judith. I'm going to open up to any questions or reflections that people have. We've only a short time before we introduce uh, Thomas Wields, the MEP, for his presentation. Um, there's some good questions in the chat. We could kick them off, uh, kick off with that if no one wants to put their hands up. Because there's quite a few of us, I can't see everyone. So if you could use the reactions button and raise hands. Uh, maybe, maybe just a, a question that I saw in chat that was good uh, from Kerry Melville, who's um, been involved in Food for Herself. She's finding it increasingly exhausting. How do you keep your foot in the pedal without burning out? Maybe, Judith, back to you for that. How do we do that, ensuring that we're having an impact but not crippling ourselves or draining ourselves too much? I think the first thing is to make sure that you're surrounded by people who energize you and are involved in work that energizes you. I mean, there are days when I don't want to get out of bed, it's so bad. But the fact that we are a community of practice collectively and being thankful for that and mm -hmm. taking from each other's force and strength. I mean, listening to people like Lisa and Bridget is hugely energizing for me because the last couple of weeks have been so hard with the Copa Cajeca, the industrial food lobby in Brussels trying to kill the farm to fork. And the week before that, we had all the corporate impacts on the agroecology and the sustainable food systems and nutrition mm -hmm. policy documents. So I think basically surround yourself by people like Lisa and Bridget, who will give you strength. And I have other many, many close friends within the food sovereignty movement who keep my energies up. I like how you brought in communities of practice. We're seeing this more and more across the social solidarity uh, movements mm -hmm. of sort of peer networks that can support each other, help each other solve problems, but deepen our ability to have impact. 
while we stay buoyant. Lisa, Bridget, anything to add to, to that? And if anyone has questions, please put your hand up. I'm happy to answer that if that's okay. Yeah. Um, for me, for me, genuinely, I think creativity is a real resource to us. Um, as I said, I used to work in community development and I wasn't using my creative side and I found that things really dragged me down and I didn't have the resources to pick myself back up. So I think whether it's that you sing or you dance or you just get it out, whatever way you can get it out, get it out and, um, and process it that way. And the other thing is the food that we're putting into our own bodies. Somebody said to me the other day, I said to her, listen, I need your help. I have to put this book finished and then I have this other book and she goes, what are you drinking? Are you drinking jungle juice? And I thought, well, actually, I am liquidizing the cucumbers, the apples, the everything from the farm every day. So, yeah, I guess it is. So just to be mindful of what we're eating ourselves and that we're not feeding ourselves the crap that's poisoning the system. And then the third thing, I just in a very simple thing. Um, a counselor said to me one time when I was having a bad time, she said, write your list. You know, because we will get burnt out and it's very hard um, to be the voice that somebody said one time, you're standing up in a river that's going this way and you're trying to stand up and say, wait, stop, yeah. that is draining. So what she said to me, and I thought it was great advice, she said, what are the things that you need to do on a daily basis to keep yourself well? Write the list. What do you need to do on a weekly basis and what do you need to do on a monthly basis? And right. they will be connecting with certain people who give yeah. you energy and eradicate the people who drain you as much as possible or limit their time. And uh, you have a support circle, I think, if you're gonna take on this work. We, we're, so not we're not islands. Building community, getting creative, having creative processes, I, I think would be really good. Uh, Bridget, anything to add? And if we want to move in a different direction, if anyone wants to put their hand up and reflect or ask a question. Yeah, no, I'd like to carry on what you're saying there about building community. You know, we do end up in our in our own little organizations and and as you say, almost burning out in them. Um, but it is it's time to link up. I mean, I, I, I hear what you say that the numbers are there. We just need to look at them differently. But unfortunately, the establishment uses that old uh, metric to say, well, you know, I mean, we had this the other day up in Dublin with a senator saying, you know, your work, you, the stuff that you're saying is, is mighty. She said. The Irish Farmers Organization is 52,000. You have 250. Why should we be listening to you? And that's where we need to kind of like come out and actually start supporting each other. You know, if, if Lisa, if, you, if you're planting trees, we pitch up and plant trees with you. But if we kind of going out there and kind of saying we need the numbers for people to just dig in and kind of say, you know what, I'm not going to join this organization for the rest of my life but yeah i'm actually going to kind of throw it my number i'm going to kind of throw it that little bit of weight just while the system is actually still using that metric um we are ahead of the system we're designing the new system the old system kind of needs to be made obsolete but unfortunately sometimes we still need some of the the what is the word i'm looking for there davy um, inspiration the motivation the uh requirements the that, that, yeah i mean well also i mean just 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 what they need to allow us to kind of participate you know? one of the things i was talking to judith in earlier was the need for um networking networks uh, a lot of what i do now is weaving different networks together uh, being involved in the csa ireland network and then urgency that Judith's the president of, also in Repess and the Social Solidarity. But there's so many different movements and networks that all have a similar mission or objective. How might we, uh, just thrown out there for a few minutes, how might we think about connecting, networking, or moving beyond their individual networks? And one of the things I love from platform cooperatives, just as a principle, which I love, is mission before organization. So then when we start to see the shared mission, the institutional ego that we have of looking out for just our organization's interests suddenly becomes looking out for the interests of all. Does that spark anything or would anyone want to add anything to that? I, I, I'm laughing. I have a, a group of Polish women looking in the window. What are you finished? <laughs> But I think, I think, you know, Davy, I think um, we all have a place that gives us energy. 
Mm-hmm. And there are so many networks. And I don't know about you, but I found at one stage they're all waving at the window. Hello, I'm coming. <laughs> but um, you know what? You can, you can, we can get drained by meetings. I used to yeah. go into meetings, meetings, meetings. And I think, you know, we, somebody said to me the other day about finding their tribe. You know, they went to a group and they found their tribe. And it's not being afraid. Like, I love what Talib feels good doing. It makes me smile. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I read it and I think, are these just brilliant? And I joined and I'm delighted to be mm-hmm. part of it. Now, I may not make it to meetings. And I may feel a little bit guilty about that, but we can't do everything. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be using carbon driving up and down the road to go to meetings, but I'll support anyone I can from here. So I think it's, you know, some people are brilliant at that. And if we all come to the table with the skills that we have, you're like you're a you're a networker, you're a mobilizer, you can bring people together from other places and other people will join in little bits of that. And I think it's just coming to the table in our full strength, in our full health and saying this is what feels good to me to do. Mm-hmm. Judith as a master network thanks for that Lisa Judith as a master networker and network weaver any suggestions here because uh, this is I think one of the things that we really need to as Bridge is saying build on numbers identify a bigger base any suggestions Judith I think one of the questions I always ask myself when I meet new people is what can we do together to reach our common goals Mm-hmm. Okay, that's nice. And maybe uh, since there's no questions from the participants, maybe that's what we'll pause and stop on. So thanks, Bridget, Lisa, and Judith for your contributions and joining us today. Uh, so I'm going to now introduce uh, Thomas Waltz. Uh, Thomas, you're very, very welcome to our session. Uh, Thomas Waltz is an Austri- Austrian MEP and, and has Uh, this unique position of also being an ecological farmer and forester. Uh, And um, he's also a politician, uh, obviously, um, but for the Green Party and has been a member of the Green European or the European Parliament since November 2017. You're very, very welcome, Thomas, to this session. Our question to you today is how from this unique perspective Uh, that you hold, might the practice of food sovereignty help us respond to the climate and ecological emergency? And maybe if there's any examples or signposts to what you see um, from European policies and actions that might support uh, agroecological initiatives or local food initiatives. Thomas. So first of all, thank you for the invitation and uh, sorry for being late. I'm in Strasbourg. We're having a parliamentarian week and it's a rather busy week. So uh, I, I had to I had to run to come uh, uh, even still uh, late. Uh, so yes, okay. Let me let me come from this angle from the European Union. Oh, let me maybe start with the COVID crisis. The COVID crisis has brought some very interesting new developments, at least in many of the states of Central and Northern Europe, which is, first of all, that uh, citizens have acknowledged what high dependency uh, the European food system or agricultural system has from importation from global streams uh, in both directions. So importation and exportation. And what we've seen across the European Union is that more and more citizens started to be concerned of where their food is actually coming from, how it is produced. It's also linked to the fact that people were not traveling abroad anymore and they were spending their time, uh, their free time, mostly around their homes. They were going out of their cities, out of their villages, seeing the landscape, seeing the forests, also seeing what happens in agriculture more than ever, which steered a very interesting development. But I'll come back to that later. Um, so so there is a, a grown, um, uh, grown interest into our food systems uh, as one of the, of the outcomes of the COVID crisis. So we're talking about food sovereignty. Well, what are we talking about when we, when, when we mean sovereignty? Europe is the biggest agricultural exporter of the world. So our agricultural system, to describe it in a few words, is basically that we're importing millions of tons of fodder, of animal fodder from anywhere of the world, a lot from South America, but from other regions as well. We're stuffing that into animals within the European Union, maybe chicken, uh, pork mainly, but also even soy is uh, used meanwhile for milk production uh, and and for for fattening um, uh, bulls. So we're putting all of that into the animals, we're growing them here, we're fattening them here, 
And then we're selling them either alive or in form of meat uh, again to half of the world. And what stays here is the stink, it's the manure, it's the, it's the over-nitrification of our soil, it's the environmental destruction, uh, it's the biodiversity destruction, it's the creation of death zones in our seas, wherever our rivers meet the sea. Uh, so we're actually keeping the destruction here. And uh, this is an agricultural system which we are funding centrally from the European Union and all of you with your taxpayers' money. Uh, we're funding this because it's just not possible to produce for world market prices in a European production environment because the production costs within the European Union are far higher than in other regions of the world. Let me just take two examples. Uh, an agricultural worker uh, in Ukraine uh, who we have an, a free trade agreement with an access, a session uh, uh, association agreement, that's how to put it. Uh, the, an agricultural worker costs 150 euros per month. In Brazil, where we import a lot of fodder, but also meanwhile beef and chicken meat from, there an agricultural worker costs 80 euros. In the European Union, there we, are, we have different levels, but in my own country, Austria, for me, it, it costs around 2,000 euros to have an employee, and then the person is still not earning very well so but I could go into detail the production costs are just much higher so what are we doing we're actually producing for world market prices we're using billions of taxpayers money to keep the farmers alive to keep their families fed to keep them working on the ground uh, and, and and just to actually export the goods but the, the profits from exporting the goods are not helping our farmers they are not that's not where, who they who, who, which they are serving uh, it's not really helping our local economies. It's not helping our rural areas because due to industrialization and intensification, we're losing more and more jobs on the ground in agriculture. So rural areas are under, under high pressure of depopulation with all the uh, uh, side effects this has. Uh, and, and just to keep the market for a very few amounts of companies, multinational companies that do the global trade. Interestingly, it's the same companies doing the import trade with fodder and so on as the companies do the export trade. So the first point, the first interesting aspect of food sovereignty would be to change this narrative, this strategy of agriculture, uh, European agriculture policy towards an angle to say, well, let's put as a priority on taking European money to support European producers to produce healthy food with best respect on environment for European citizens. And that's what we should use taxpayers' money for. And why? what is the argument for that? Well, first of all, it's the overall economical uh, um, uh, picture, you know, the bigger picture of our, of our economies. Uh, the, today, the fact is that conventional production is not has not implemented uh, in its pricing the externalities, so the external effects or external damages of the production. It's not covered by the food price, and it's not paid by the producers nor by the traders. I give you a very concrete example. In my home region, uh, there's very intensive pork production. So due to the intensive pork production, there's a lot of manure spilled on the, on the fields. Due to that manure on the fields, we have a, a, a high level of nitrate in the soil water. Due to that high level of nitrate, the regional water provider has to develop all kinds of strategies to reduce that amount of nitrate, filtering, mixing it with other waters, which they bring in pipelines from the Alps. And the effect is that the water costs in the region are among the highest of all over Austria. So every single citizen pays with his or her water bill the actual price for this so-called cheap pork meat production. This is just one example. If you integrate the environmental damages, the climate damages, the biodiversity damages into, into price uh, and if you even see the negative effects of uh, low, uh, low vitamins, low mineral, so bad food on our health, 
the health effects of industrialized produced food are enormous. They are putting an enormous pressure on our health systems. They are creating enormous economical downturns, uh, which, which if we see the whole picture and if we integrate the whole picture into pricing, organic products are 30% cheaper than every conventional product in average. So just to, that, that is a, a very valid argument why we should really rethink our way of production. And food sovereignty is for me the, also the, the basis of argumentation to say, well, look, Europe produce good food for your citizens, but stop spilling the global market with dumping price products dumping prices that are based on our taxpayers' money actually paying for the production uh, and stop compromising food sovereignty of other countries in the world, very much developing countries, which then suffer from the direct effects of our cheap food exports. May it be milk powder that is much cheaper in African countries than the local milk production, or may it be the leftovers of chicken, you know, the carcasses and wings that we're dumping on the markets and killing the local uh, chicken production from local farmers, causing directly that farmers have to give up their businesses, are moving to the slums of the city and are increasing the poverty of these countries and the structural problems of the future. So our agricultural policy is directly compromising um, uh, the, the food sovereignty of, of, of many developing countries. And by implementing food sovereignty concepts within our very own agricultural policy, this is the, one of the main effects would be to also release the pressure on all of these countries, which are mostly poorer and mostly have also uh, problems with uh, hunger and with a lack of food uh, supply. Now, let me go a bit further. I mean, the common agriculture policy. We fought hard for every little green thing that you find in there. And acknowledging the situation in Ireland with only 2% organic farming, I, I can even see that this common agriculture policy even shows some progress for your agricultural scene, uh, because we managed to get quite some stuff in it. Um, as an example, also a clear aim to support organic agriculture, agroecological methods. Um, but, but to, to my point of view, we did by far not go far enough. If you see that actually agriculture and forestry are the only concrete proposals how to get CO2 back out of the atmosphere, uh, and not just getting it back out of the atmosphere, but actually changing uh, the, the way we fertilize our fields from artificial fertilizer to green fertilizer, which are plants that collect CO2 via photosynthesis and produce plant material, maybe wood or, or, or leaves or vegetables, uh, or, or just fertilizer, which we then uh, uh, dig into the soil and through this create compost, create humus, create fertile soils, which are able to store water, to sustain our food production, also in times of droughts, to prevent ourselves from, from floods, uh, to change this model. To, this would be the, the the biggest contribution towards CO2 neutrality uh, we could have, the whole sector would have a massive uh, um, um, uh, <clears throat> potential to actually deliver. Uh, this has not been met by the common agriculture policy, even if some parts are quite OK. Uh, uh, the the, uh, the uh, farm to fork strategy was uh, also mentioned already. We voted on it today. We, I think we managed, I didn't see the outcomes yet, but I, I think we managed to defeat the, the, tri the tries of the, of the uh, mainly meat lobby to actually kill the process in the very last minute. So we will see a farm to fork strategy that calls for minus 50% artificial fertilizer uh, and, and for minus 50% uh, pesticides and for 25% organic farming all over the European Union. And why is this a fertilizer story also a question of food sovereignty? Because if you use green fertilizer, then you are depending with your production on your land and your, on the ability to grow something on your land. If we use artificial fertilizer, which is basically made uh, uh, for the production you need gas 
So we, you need approximately two kilo of gas for one kilo of artificial fertilizer. So we are depending on gas imports, on fossil fuels, on our farms, and then independent and sovereign farming would mean grow based on your own land, what you're able to grow on that. So this would also contribute to sovereignty. The same is with seeds. Uh, yeah, there's less and less uh, um, non-hybrid seeds on the market that more and more uh, is captured by big corporate which are, by the way, the same cooperatives that produce the chemicals. So they will always sell us seeds that need the chemicals because that's their business model. Yeah, so also growing our own seeds again, the old varieties, defending our rights to grow seeds and to share them with each other is that direct contribution to food sovereignty. Um, also growing animals based on the land you have, same concept. If you're sovereign, if you're able to feed your animals yourself, and that would also prevent us from overnitrification. Then we would have a kind of a circle economy on the farms where animals can play a role, where they, they have a respected place in the, cir in the circulation of, fer of fertilizer and, and, and so on. Um, uh, to not get too long, um, well, just one last sentence on farm to fork. Where is that resistance coming from? Look, no matter if you go completely organic or you even seriously try within conventional agriculture to go agroecological, who is losing money? Look, me as an organic farmer, I don't buy the artificial fertilizer, so the industry loses. I don't buy the pesticide, again, the industry loses. My animals do not need medication, or very, very rarely. The next big industry, pharma industry, loses. Yeah, so you see, my, I produce the seeds myself, so the seed industry loses. And if you sum that all up, pharma industry, chemical industry, seed industry, fossil fuel industry, you have the biggest multinational companies of the world that are profiting from this agricultural system. Them. It's not the farmers, because the farmers are closing their farms. Every day we're losing hundreds of farms in the European Union because the small and medium-sized farms cannot produce, cannot stand that unfair competition anymore from the big industrialized plants. So it's not them profiting, not at all. It's the big multinational companies that are uh, uh, lobbying us and that are doing whatever they can to, to uh, stop this kind of Green Deal policies uh, that I was talking about. And just to give some positive perspectives. So what happened through COVID is that people started, especially in Central and Northern European Euro uh, Union, to go out and meet the farmers, to see where the food comes from. We had a massive increase on direct marketing. Whatever marketing scheme you have, whether it's the farmer's market, it's direct delivery of vegetable boxes, whether it's uh, food coops like in cities that were a whole, whole house with many flats, starts to buy directly with the farmers and distribute within the house. The interest on solidarity, solidarity farm or community-based farming was increasing massively. There were many more people that were willing to buy a share than actually farmers that were able to offer this kind of participatory uh, farming method. So that increased substantially. And also the demand for organic food increased substantially. And uh, yes, sure, I mean, uh, do you, can, you need to have the farmers to actually then also fulfill the demand and it's, uh, I'm, I'm talking from a privileged position because in Austria, we're having 25% of all land under organic farming. Meanwhile, and, and, and that's why also we can move on and we do move on with public procurement uh, with organic food. Uh, I think Judith has mentioned it, or, or Lisa, I don't recall now, but that's a key issue. If you see how big the share is of all the kindergartens, the schools, the, the, the elderly homes, you know, the hospitals, the, the canteens in universities, it's a big share of the actual whole market. And there is so many reasons, as I mentioned earlier, you know, all the externalities, but also the health costs. So there's so many reasons for the state itself to invest into organic and to change towards regional and organic uh, uh, food supply for these public kitchens and for this public pro procurement um, that, that this can steer the demand and really kind of skyrocket the production very fast. We just need to take responsible positions uh, and, and decisions uh, also in the political scene. And it's, it's very important to push for that and to argue for that because this can really unchain a huge development towards organic production. Uh, yes, and uh, also the cooperation with tourism is key uh, uh, because uh, hotels and so on, uh, they more and more, especially in, in Central Europe, they more and more see 
it as a, as a quality sign if they can tell, well, this beef comes from there and these vegetables come from there. They're actually putting it on their menu, a whole list of who supplies them with what. That's more and more, let's say, an added value. Uh, uh, and more and more citizens, guests, tourists actually appreciate that and prefer these kinds of restaura restaurants uh, to go to. So also these corporations can, can really steer uh, demand and, and a direct cooperation, you know, direct cooperation in the region, short uh, food chains, short transportation, little carbon, yeah? and also, you know, the knowledge that, that, that the cook or maybe even the waiter can say, well, you know what, just going to the next village is the farmer so-and-so. And if you want to see how they, their cat lives, just go and go there. This gives, you know, authenticity. This gives, uh, this gives uh, a direct feel uh, um, uh, what, what you're actually eating. There's good concepts on the ground and there's very good development across the European Union. And I hope that Ireland is now with that cap strategic plan you were talking about, finally joining uh, this pan-European effort to change our agriculture towards a sustainable one, towards a self-sufficient or sovereign one, towards a local one, uh, and that we finally get out of this destructive industrial agriculture system. And I thank you so much for all of your personal contributions to that change. Thank you so much, Thomas. It's uh, great to hear a politician speaking like this. Uh, and a farmer uh, stepping into the political sphere to make a difference. So thank you for your work. I'm going to open it up to questions now, and maybe I might just start by asking you a question. You sort of referred to when you talked about procurement. Uh, is there any talk or is there, could, might we see some policies that would support community wealth building, a sort of local and green procurement that would um, encourage or even force uh, big spenders in our regions or our cities uh, to use organic food or to use co-ops and social solidarity initiatives rather than the money just escaping our region. So uh, keeping our wealth circulating as we see in the model of Preston or Cleveland. Any hope for that or Thomas, any reflections on that? Well, first of all, uh, the, the common agriculture policy that we have negotiated now is allowing that to the member states. Uh, we had a, a major shift in, in the way the cap is actually constructed. Before, the old cap had certain measurements defined and the member states could choose within that list of measurements. Now it's only goals defined and every nation decides on their own how they're going to reach the goals and they can kind of have to propose that in the cap strategic plan to the Commission, they have to show how they create a, a positive impact on biodiversity, how they create a, a, a reduction of 30% of CO2 emissions, which is directly leading to agroecological methods or even organic, uh, and, and they have to also show how they re-strengthen regional food systems. We clearly have the goal to rebuild local food systems, regional food systems, um, and there is allocation of money, of funds for that. Uh, but again, it's a decision of your government how much they make use of the different possibilities the CAP offers. Right. One thing that we were able to include which was quite a battle, was all the new forms of agriculture. So community-based agriculture, solidaric agriculture, all these direct interlinked consumer producer concepts, which were not eligible for agriculture fundings uh, up to the last cap, but they will be now. At least there's no uh, um, obstacles from the European side. Again, it's very much in the hand uh, of your governments. Uh, so yes, uh, basically the legislation is there to let it happen, uh, but it also needs the political will of the member state. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Thomas. We're, we want to hear some other voices. So I'm going to bring Judith in. You have a question. If you want to come in, can you raise your hand? Probably in the reactions below, because uh, I can't see everyone. Um, but Judith. Yep. Thank you very much, Thomas. That was really, really good. And I was so happy to hear about the Farm to Fork vote, because I haven't managed to get the feedback on that yet, because it was a real struggle. Um, on the question of public procurement, for example, in the Spanish Basque country, they now have a significant victory because public procurement uh, 